yeah, so let's get started. Uh, I want to set some expectations. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that I was going to debug your feelings for you. I'm actually going to help you debug your feelings just so no one's expecting me to solve all the problems tonight. Uh, my name is Jamie Strawn, and uh, I am I'm technically not a developer anymore. I'm a manager now. I run a team of four developers, but I was a developer for a very long time, so I sort of still feel like I call myself a developer some days more than others. And part of that's just because I've been doing it for so long. It was 16 years ago that I got my first job as a developer, and I've been working at getting better ever since. And part of that for me is about reading books and reading articles. It's about learning tools and techniques. It's about talking to people, to other professionals. It's about working through challenges and practicing, and coffee helps too. And I feel like after all this time, I should have it all figured out, right? And I don't, of course. I still struggle, I still have good days and bad days, I'm still learning things. But I've been able to get to where I am today because of the time and the effort that I've put in and because of the help that I've gotten along the way. Uh, it was 17 years ago I was diagnosed with depression and I have been working at getting better ever since. And for me that's about reading books and reading articles, that's about learning tools and techniques, it's about talking to people, to professionals, uh, it's about working through challenges and practicing. Uh, and medication helps too. And part of me thinks that after all this time I should have it all figured out. Uh, and I don't. I still struggle. I still have good days and bad days. I'm still learning things. But I've been able to get to where I am today because of the time and the effort that I've put in and because of the help that I've gotten along the way. So these two things have been kind of central to most of my adult life. And I didn't really think that hard about the relationship between the two until sort of recently. I was rereading a book, a book called Feeling Good by Dr. David Burns, and it teaches something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is generally used to treat uh, mood disorders, depression, anxiety, that kind of thing. And it was diagnosed, or it was prescribed to me by my doctor who gave me my diagnosis, and I've read it multiple times ever since. Sometimes just bits and pieces, sometimes the whole thing. And cognitive behavioral therapy really helped me, taught me really useful techniques that I could use. And part of me realized that, in a way, that was because it kind of spoke to me as a developer, that certain things in the book and the way that it was taught kind of fit with my developer brain. And that got me thinking that maybe other people who sort of thought like I did, who solve problems like I did, might be able to get something out of CBT as well. Of course, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not trying to treat or diagnose mental disorder, but CBT has some things that can tell us about how we can do our best work. So, what is CBT? Cognitive behavioral therapy is based on a pretty simple model. It looks something like this. Right? We have experiences in our life. We, have, we see things and we hear things and things happen to us and around us. And then we have responses. Right? We feel a certain way about that experience. Right? Are we going to do something about it? And it often feels like it's the straight line, right? That person pissed me off. But this thing made me really excited. But I'm willing to bet that everyone in this room, at this point, despite the fact that you're all having the same experience, right? You're all listening to me, you're all seeing the same slides, you're having different responses. Maybe subtly, maybe you're curious, you're interested, maybe you're bored, maybe you're angry at me for not talking about graph databases or whatever it is. <laughs> but there's more to it, right, than just the experience. And that's because what actually drives our response are our thoughts. It's the way we think about and interpret those experiences that actually cause us to respond the way we do. And this isn't incredibly new. Shakespeare talked about this a couple hundred years ago. There's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And so cognitive behavioral therapy has this idea that if our responses come from the way that we think, then if we want to change the way we respond, we have to look at those thought patterns. We have to look at the traps that we're falling into, the mistakes that we're making, the ways that we're thinking irrationally to be able to do something about those irrational responses that we're having. And that's what it teaches. But to put it in CBT does, we can change how we feel if we change how we think. I mentioned parallels. I mentioned that this reminded me of developer-like things. And this was the first place that that came up. So this model reminded me of like a simple program. Right? And my suggestion here is not that we're all minus Tom Tom, but the idea is that the programs that we write have input and they have output. Right? But it's not the input itself that determines the output, it's the code. It's the rules and the logic that go into that program that actually determine 
how the output is going to be. Well, that's interesting. That looks a lot like the CBT model. And so I started thinking more about this and looking more at what was the same, but also what was different. So I'm going to walk through two examples. Let's talk about code first. So I was a web developer for a long time, so I might get some project like this. I want to build some little thing where I make an API call, I get some data, I bring it back, I want to put it into a table, add some features like pagination and sorting that way. So sit down and bang away at this for a while, and then open my browser, right? See what I've got. And what I've got is this, which is a point where I want it to be. It's getting there. There's some things I can see that are problematic, but I can I can fix this, right? I can go back into my code and fix it. Let's talk about the other kind of situation, right? Our experiences. Let's say I'm sitting down at the same project. And I start thinking about it. I start thinking, okay, I started on this thing. Uh, I, haven't, uh, I haven't used this API before, so I can start getting the documentation. Although, if I guess I'm going to make an API called probably some sort of library that's going to let me actually talk back over. So, I need to use the library. I really need to actually go build a pipeline thing, so I should maybe pick my tools there. And then, actually, really, there's a lot of ES6 stuff that I haven't learned yet. So, I'm going to use that. I, should, I think I still need to use Babel, but I'm not quite sure. Maybe Webpack, I think, I've heard. Friends of mine using React, and, and I, maybe that's the one I'm supposed to use. I'm starting to feel a little overwhelmed about getting started on this project. And of course, instead of actually working on it, then I decided that maybe tonight's a really good night for me to go see Black Panther because I hadn't seen it yet. I'm afraid it's going to leave theater soon. So I don't want to actually do the work, and then I come back one or two or four or six days later, and I haven't done any work, and now I'm starting to feel a little guilty, right? Because I haven't actually done anything. I'm such a procrastinator. Like, I always do this. And so, of course, that doesn't actually make me want to work on it, right? So I leave it, and I finish binge watching Jessica Jones, which I haven't finished before now. Two, three, six nights later, I finally come back to it, and now I'm starting to feel really nervous, right? Because I haven't even started on this, and the deadline's coming up, and I'm not sure I didn't get this finished. And this scenario that we can work ourselves into is actually similar to this. That in both cases, what we want is a working application, right? And in neither case do we have it. But there's an important difference between how we respond to these different scenarios. When we're looking at a stream like that, what we're doing is testing, right? We're looking at whether or not the output that we've got is the output that we want. And if it's not, that's fine. We'll go back and fix it, right? We'll do some more work. We know how to do this. Different when we start feeling like this. We have this tendency to trust our feelings, to believe that because we're feeling this way, it must be real, it must be justified. And that's not strictly true. In fact, this is such a common mistake to make that cognitive behavioral therapy has a name for it. It's called emotional reasoning. Emotional reasoning is the belief that because I feel this way, it must be justified. Maybe it's the only way I can possibly feel. Because I feel overwhelmed, I must be facing something overwhelming. Because I feel guilty, I must be, I must have done something really bad. Now what's interesting is if you think about it like this. That would be like me sitting down to do this project, opening up my browser, seeing that, and saying, I guess I'm done. Because it's on the screen. And if it's on the screen, that must be what I want, and therefore I must be done. So the first thing to take away from cognitive behavioral therapy is that we shouldn't trust our feelings. We should behave like developers. We should test our feelings. We should see whether or not the way that we're responding is actually helping us, whether it's reasonable and rational. And if it isn't, we can do something about it. It's hard sometimes to realize that. Now, if we can make sure enough headspace to be able to realize that the way they're responding isn't helping us, what do we do? Remember, this was how I was responding to that project, right? Let's go back to being a developer. If I have output that looks like this, what do I do? I don't my browser, or my editor, right? I have to change the code. I can't stare at the output for long enough to fix it. I can't think hard enough about it to fix it. I have to change the code, else it's not going to change. What does an editor look like for a fox? Turns out it looks like this. This is my notebook. Actually, my notebook, you'll notice. I've gone from my quasi-design slides to like actual photographs of the notebook. 
this is important. It was a really difficult thing to do. We'll see why in a second. But it's worth it because I'm going to teach you a technique. I want you to remember it. But if you take one thing away from this, the actual act of writing this stuff down, analog, pen to paper, a lot of digital people, this is weird, but writing this stuff down is actually really profound. That getting those thoughts out of our head can actually help give us just enough perspective to see what's really going on. They have this kind of like home field advantage while they're rattling around our brain. It makes it really hard to sort of get a hold of them and really understand what they're doing to us. Writing them down, physically writing them down, gets them out of our head and gives us some perspective. So, what I can teach you is something called a two-column technique, because this is a line, so it goes like a left line. Two-column technique. Left-hand side, we're going to label automatic thoughts. The reason these are automatic thoughts, what we're going to write down here, are the things that we were thinking that caused us to feel the way we felt. Now, those feelings, those responses, that's the output, right? We're not dealing with that, we're dealing with the code. So automatic thoughts are going to be the bad code, the code we're fixing. The thought patterns that got us feeling the way that we're feeling. And we have to deal with the thoughts, right? The automatic part is to remind us that sometimes it's not obvious what it is that we were thinking that got us into it. Sometimes it's, it's so habitual or it happens so fast that we don't realize there was even a thought process that happened. So sometimes you have to dig in a little bit. It's like a, it's like a weird stack trace where you get like some crazy error over here that doesn't mean anything. You have to dig, dig until you get to the actual part of the code where the system comes from. So that's an area I was talking about, right? I was uh, overwhelmed. And I was overwhelmed because I was thinking, this is going to be hard. Right? Just think about all the things I was going to have to do that I didn't know. Right? You have that going around your head long enough, you start to feel pretty overwhelmed. And I was feeling guilty because I'm sort of beating myself over the head with this idea that I'm going to fast better. Right? I always do this. And then I was nervous because I was telling myself I'm not going to finish on time. Right? Uh, these aren't sort of wild random thoughts. They might resonate with you a little bit. You might be able to remember times when you thought this stuff. So that's what we're going to do on the left-hand side, write down those thoughts that are with us. The right-hand side, we're going to write rational responses. And the idea here, again, if this is debugging, that left-hand side is the bad code, we need good code on the right. We need to look at what would be more rational and reasonable ways to think about this stuff that we're thinking about. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy has a number of what are called cognitive distortions that it identifies. These are like traps, patterns that we fall into. I mentioned emotional reasoning, that's one of them. I'm going to show you what the distortions are for thoughts like these. Not because you have to remember them specifically, but you might recognize some of the patterns in yourself. And if you search anywhere for cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive distortions, you'll get a list of 9 or 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever. It depends on which list you're looking at. Um, you won't really relate to all of them, but some of them will mean a lot to you. So I'm going to show you what they are just as kind of a shorthand. Don't worry about memorizing that part. So this first bit, this is going to be hard. So what's going on here is something called fortune telling. The idea is that we have this thought, we're projecting out into the future, and believing that projection to be true, to be like a foregone conclusion, right? This is going to be hard. And the thing about fortune telling is that as much as I might like to be able to, I can't actually predict the future. This might be I'm educated guess, maybe, a probability, maybe, but I can't know it. And so to respond as though it's already happened or it's destined to happen doesn't make sense. So when you're looking at these automatic thoughts, one of the things to look for is what's wrong with them? Why are they distorted? Why are they wrong? What's the lie underneath that thought? But it's also important to acknowledge the fact that there's truth here too. These thoughts wouldn't be compelling to us if they didn't have some kernel, some, some core truth that resonates with us. Right? If these were totally wild, random thoughts, they, they wouldn't affect us. So what's true about this? Truth is, it might be hard, right? We don't know that it's not going to be either. But we can respond a lot more rationally to the idea that it could be hard, right? Because actually, as part of our jobs, often we volunteer to do difficult things, right? We actually kind of like doing difficult things sometimes. Being difficult is not necessarily a bad thing. And that's because sometimes difficult things are also fun, or educational, or interesting, or financially lucrative. 
There are other reasons to do this stuff. And if you start thinking about this situation with those kinds of thoughts, right? I can't know this for sure, there might be other reasons that I want to do this. Hopefully you can see how those kinds of thoughts are going to lead you back towards being more motivated, more curious, more interested, more excited to actually start work on this. I'm a procrastinator. Uh, this is something called labeling. Labeling is name calling. So we do this to ourselves, we call ourselves lazy, procrastinator, we do it to other people, as a jerk, an asshole, whatever it is. The problem with labeling is that we're taking a complex human being and reducing them down to this one simple trait. I'm saying I'm a procrastinator. I've always been a procrastinator. I always will be a procrastinator. I have no choice but to be a procrastinator. Which again, isn't true. Right? The problem with labeling is that it's a fast oversimplification. I'm not any one thing. I'm not a procrastinator any more than I'm a, an eater or a breather or a speaker. And so we can remember that this doesn't define us. However, there's truth here too. Right? I may not be a procrastinator, but I do procrastinate. Right? That's a thing that I do, it's a choice that I make. You know, the best one, but it's true. However, if it's framed like that, this is the thing that I do, that I choose sometimes, I can make a different choice. Right? That gives me back some of that agency. And in fact, I don't always procrastinate, I know that. I didn't procrastinate getting into bed this morning, or making my son breakfast, or coming here tonight. So I can make different choices, right? Starting to think like this can remind me that, okay, okay, this is still under my control. I still have agency here. And the last one, actually really similar to the first one. This is another example of fortune telling. Again, whenever you see yourself thinking, this is going to be, I will not be able to, I am going to, looking into the future like that, generally fortune telling. So we can remind ourselves I don't know how to predict the future, the other thing about fortune telling, kind of like labeling, is that it takes away our agency. Right? We forget that what's going to happen between now and then is actually based on what we do. I have control over the outcome. Right? This isn't set in stone. So it might not finish on time, that's the truth. But the lie is that it's definitely going to not finish on time. So I have control, and now that I have control back, if it's possible that it's not going to finish on time, what am I going to do about it? And maybe there are other options, right? If I still have agency here, maybe I can maybe I can extend the deadline, right? Or decrease the scope, or get someone to help me. I still have control. And so this is the idea of the two column technique. You're going to write down those thoughts, you're going to start working through them, identify what the why is of those thoughts, and hopefully identify and acknowledge what the truth is. This takes practice doesn't come easily. And so, sort of like, next level version of this. If you're able to identify those thoughts, or having a really hard time coming up with how to respond to them. So one thing you can do is take your book, go find a friend, a loved one, someone you care about and trust, and give them your book. And have them role play being the person who's in this situation. So they're coming to you saying, oh my god, I'm supposed to work on this project, but I'm feeling super overwhelmed. I know it's going to be super hard. I feel really guilty because I'm always procrastinating with this, right? I'm really nervous to not finish on time. And see what you would say to me. How would you address those concerns they're bringing to you? We have this capacity for compassion and empathy that we don't always extend to ourselves. I say a lot of things to myself in my head that I would never say. To anybody else. So using someone else to reflect this back to you can actually help unlock that and give you the ability to help that other person and help yourself. So this is what cognitive behavioral therapy teaches us. That we can change how we feel if we change how we feel. And it turns out approaching this like a developer is actually really beneficial. We want to test our feelings, right? Don't just trust them. See whether or not the way you're responding is actually helping you. That are unhelpful, get them out of your head. Write them down. Someone's talking about with people, but writing them down is, again, surprisingly beneficial. And above all, get help. None of us do our jobs alone. 
And so none of us should feel like we have to struggle with difficult emotions alone. There shouldn't be any more stigma to reading more about CBT or helping, having a friend help you work through some emotions or going to see a therapist and there would be reading an article about JavaScript writing or pair programming or going to a meetup or conference to see someone speak about the topic you're interested in. It was 16 years ago I got my first job as a web developer. And 17 years ago I was diagnosed with depression and I have gotten a lot of help, both, ever since. So, 20 minutes ago, I started teaching you what CBT and those would help you too. So the question was, have I thought about a way to like roll this out, I guess, to a bigger audience of my company, or if I'm doing this sort of one-on-one? -on -one? So I've done this talk a few times to sort of audiences like this, um, as far as I've gotten. <laughs> I, I tend to deal with it sort of one-on-one, -on -one or like in groups who have kind of opted into it, only because I'm very wary about intruding into someone else's stuff. Like if people are dealing with difficult things like this, I'm very load to sort of show up and be like, hey, don't worry, I can fix this, read this book, and let me tell you about CBT. Like, I don't want to be that person. I, it doesn't tend to help. If someone is not looking for that kind of assistance, then I don't want to force it on. So the answer is no. I would love to in some way, but like, just to start that. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So where can we find the list of what are called cognitive distortions? Like literally search cognitive distortion or cognitive behavioral therapy and you'll find it. There are dozens of them. Cognitive behavioral therapy is like one of the most, if not the most prescribed uh, therapy options for depression and anxiety. So it's not, this stuff is not like secret. Um, incredibly often books like Feeling Good and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy are prescribed along with medication for people that are dealing with mood disorder. So. Yeah, it's really, really easy to find, which is part of the reason I didn't go into it a lot. Search cognitive distortion or cognitive behavioral therapy, you'll find it really easy. Yeah, so yeah, the, the list of distortions, it kind of depends who wrote it. Um, in Feeling Good, the book that, that uh, I use, there's about 11, I think, although two of them are sort of closely related. Yeah, I've seen lists of 15, I've seen lists of nine. But again, like the idea is that they're not all necessarily going to resonate closely with you, but they'll be. It will definitely be, say, three or four, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, 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 that's me every day. I do that, <laughs> I do that one for sure. So, yeah, don't worry about like, memorizing the entire list or finding the longest list or whatever. You'll find the things and you will recognize which ones you like to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, just I, I really appreciate the whole slide. I think it's something that's really important. I think we all, regardless of whether it's also or not, I think we all. That are so stressful most of the time, and even if you're an ambitious person, to add in more onto yourself with that stress, because you're pushing yourself to achieve something at the same time, and just everything else to kind of see guided steps that you help. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I'm you're a manager of four developers. Could you highlight some of the things that come from the community as well? Uh, so, sorry, one more time. More like, um, as a becoming manager, can you give me any more insight? Yeah, so the question is Has becoming a manager of developers sort of changed my perspective or giving me more insight into CBT now that I have my new role? Uh, the answer is kind of yes, although, like, sort of related to the question earlier. I, I don't sort of like go to my team members and whenever they come to have a problem, I'm like, oh, read this book or go read this article or whatever. Uh, but I'm pretty open about this kind of thing. And so a lot of this for me is like, um, you know, the whole thing of like putting the oxygen mask on yourself first. So this is really important to me because if I'm not my best, then like that affects my whole team. So different than like, me just being an individual contributor doing my stuff like i know yes my work's going to suffer if i'm like, really struggling with this stuff but now that i have a, a team that i'm working with like 
that multiplies the effect of anything that I'm struggling with. So I tend to be pretty open about the fact that I have challenges with this, and my team is pretty open about it with me. And it's mostly just that, like, knowing that I have a team that's looking to me for guidance on these things, also giving talks like this, or kind of reminders that, like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm really supposed to know how to do this, <laughs> and I should be able to, and I'm like happy to teach people. Um, but every time I give this talk, someone's like, hey, this would work for designers, or like, this would work for project managers, I'm like, yeah. Content behavior that is not for developers, that's just, it was useful for me as a framing device, but the content, like I say, like CBT is the, the most prescribed approach for mood disorder, so it's really, really applicable. I just sort of like the idea of being able to teach it this way to people that will understand the kind of frame analogies and stuff. But, um, so yes, to some degree, but also it's more just like understanding how it affects me, which affects me too. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. 